We are live. Welcome everyone to our media briefing. It's Monday, May 25th. Today we will have up updates from Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong, as well as from Regional Chair Karen Redmond and Region of Waterloo CAO Mike Murray will be here to answer your questions. So let's get started with Dr. Shuli Wong. Go ahead, Shuli. Good morning, everyone. So overall, we continue to see signs of stabilization in our numbers of new cases. In carefully conducting our data quality checks, we determined that an additional person associated with the Forest Heights outbreak who had been in hospital had passed away in mid-May, but had not been counted yet in our dashboard. So our overall total number of COVID associated deaths is now 113. So my sincerest condolences again to the family, friends and loved ones of all those who have passed. Of those 20 deaths, of those 113, I mean, 20 deaths are associated with cases in the community and 93 are associated with long-term care and retirement home outbreaks. So there are positive signs, but we are still in a precarious state. We will also need to carefully monitor the trends going forward as a result of the lifting of restrictions. Yesterday marked the start of Paramedic Services Week, an annual celebration of paramedics across Canada. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of paramedic services. Our paramedics play an important role in our community. They are on the front lines of the healthcare system and they remain committed to excellence in patient care. One component of the service is the Community Paramedicine Program. It is a non-emergency service that works to prevent unnecessary 911 calls and emergency department visits while supporting people in their home or in the community. As testing has expanded, the Community Paramedicine Program is also supporting testing in the region as a mobile team. They are helping to perform expanded testing in, in congregate settings like retirement homes. And they are also testing individuals who need to be tested before being admitted to long-term care or hospice and who are unable to leave, to leave their home to travel to a testing site. So thank you very much for your service to our community. In closing, everything we do as a community will continue to, to determine how the rates of infection progress in the weeks ahead, especially as businesses continue to open up and more and more people come into closer proximity with others. So I'd like to remind all residents that it is critically important that we continue to follow public health measures, continue to practice physical distancing whenever you leave your home and wear a non-medical mask when you are around others, continue to wash your hands often, continue to spend time only with your household contacts for now, do not socialize in groups. If you have any symptoms, stay home and make an appointment to get tested as a reminder, a negative test result does not exempt you from continuing to follow these measures. This past weekend, I have heard reports of our citizens practicing physical distancing and wearing masks. I really want to thank those in our community who are practicing these types of behaviors. You are setting an example for all of us. Let's continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We'll now hear from Region of Waterloo Chair Karen Redman. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Julie. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the vulnerable in our community continue to be most affected. Marginalized groups, youth, children and the elderly, 
essential workers and newcomers are just some of those in our community who are facing increased challenges right now. Launched May 19th, the federal government has made $350 million available through the Emergency Community Support Fund to provide additional and much needed assistance to charities and nonprofit organizations during COVID-19. In, in a collaborative tradition of Waterloo Region, the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation, the Cambridge and North Front, uh, Dumfries Community Foundation and the United Way Waterloo Region Communities are working together to jointly review the applications for funding to support those organizations who need it the most right now. Together, all three organizations have approximately $2.25 million to distribute across Waterloo Region before July 27th, 2020. While this funding won't address all the needs of our local charities and nonprofits, it's an important first step to helping our vulnerable citizens and getting Waterloo Region back on its feet. I encourage community organizations to reach out and apply for this funding. Applications for financial support opened on May 19th and each organization can apply for up to $75,000. The deadline for applications is July 14th, 2020. A good starting point for more information locally is the Kitchener Waterloo Community Foundation website kwcf.ca slash COVID-19 ECSF. Together this additional funding, we can make the lives of those of our most vulnerable communities a little easier during COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay, I will now turn it over for questions and we'll start with Joanna from the record. Go ahead, Joanna. Thank you. Um, just hoping Dr. Wong could um, talk a bit about what's going on at the local testing centers after the Premier's announcement yesterday that anyone could get tested even if they don't have symptoms and just show up, don't book an appointment. Uh, yes, I, I would refer, I'm gonna have to refer that question to the, to the testing centers themselves. Um, as uh, they would um, be best able to answer those questions. Okay, and then I have a few questions from a colleague as well. Um, mm -hmm. So are you concerned about the persistent spread of the virus in the community? Like it's stable, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing it go down. Does that worry you? And do we know, have an idea of where these infections are happening, that like the transmission is happening? Mm -hmm. So uh, to answer your first question, um, this is what we are seeing across Ontario, uh, that there's a persistent um, uh, degree of, of, of spread, uh, but um, that, um, you know, it's relatively stable, or maybe in some areas it's recently started to increase again. Uh, at, this, at this point in time, it hasn't done that here. Um, so I, I think this is something that we can expect to happen until we have measures like a vaccine uh, to be able to, you know, fully immunize the population against it. And so that's really a reason why those physical distancing measures, for example, and those other measures that I mentioned are going to be really important um, because the goal isn't um, to, to make that come down to zero uh, as we likely wouldn't be able to, but the goal is to make sure that, um, you know, we try to prevent cases where we can and to have the rates such as, uh, have the rates such that they wouldn't overwhelm our healthcare system. Um, so yeah, so what, what we're seeing is what I would expect to see here. And the second question, right. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick look, uh, just going to really quick, a quick look at our dashboard because we do have the classification of um, where we believe the cases acquired their infection from. So I'm just going to take a quick look and I will, uh, yeah, okay, so 
I'm just going to pull up my screen share. Screen share. Is it, it's not working. Okay. Okay. So what we see with the screen share, I just pointed out here, is uh, under transmission type. Um, so we have close contact, community, and outbreak related. Outbreak related would be also could also be classified as close contact. For example, I don't think that the province has an outbreak related category, but they would consider that close contact because that's how outbreaks happen. Um, so if you take a look at this, um, we still have we also have travel. So it looks like that the majority are, of our cases, we've been able to identify a source, but there are about 23% of cases for which we have not been able to, to identify a source and are therefore considered community cases. Uh, community though is fairly broad. Like, do we have an idea? Like, is there a particular area in the community where people are more likely to acquire the virus? Oh, uh, it's not, based on what we've seen, it's not like a particular area of the region. It's more that uh, most often when people have, uh, when people get the, the infection, they pass it on to their close contacts. So their family members or their friends, or if they're in a workplace and there's not sufficient, you know, physical distancing, for example, they, they could pass it to their worker, um, to their work colleagues. So it's that type of, um, trend that we see. Um, but sometimes for 23% of the cases, uh, we haven't been able to identify um, where those cases got the infection from exactly because we don't have, for example, oh, they were in contact with someone else who has been confirmed as a case of COVID. Um, so, you know, as we, um, as we work to expand the testing and the case and contact management as a result of the testing, um, then you know what we hope to do is to be able to identify more of those links, um, and we'll have to we'll have to monitor. Um, it's one of the indicators that we're going to monitor in terms of overall ability to have a good idea of where the infections are coming from. Okay, um, I'll pass it along to someone else now. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. We'll pass it over to Damon from Woolwich Observer. Go ahead, Damon. Hello. Um, so my first question is for Dr. Wong. There hasn't been any more uh, cases of COVID related to Conestoga meets in Breslau. Um, are we still expecting those results to be coming in or is this kind of the end all right now? Uh, I'm just going to double check again the dashboard. So many numbers. <laughs> um, I, I think there's been an update since Friday. We do the updates for Conestoga meets Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Um, but overall, we, as I mentioned on Friday, we continue to see a slowing down of new cases and an increase of the number of cases which has which has been resolved. So I actually, my, my screen is frozen, but I'm gonna see if I can find the latest numbers some other way. Hold on a second here. Uh, okay, as of this morning's dashboard, 93 positive cases of which 78 are resolved. Okay. Um, and then some uh, supermarkets are making masks mandatory now. Um, is this something that public health agrees with? Um, that is an organizational decision in terms of their policies with respect to masks. I recommend that um, when people are out and about with other people, uh, that they wear non-medical masks if possible. Yes. Great. Well, that's all my questions for today. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Damon. Okay, Kate, over to you. Great. Um, my first question is actually for uh, Mike. Um, I have two quick ones. Um, one is it's going to be very hot <laughs> for the next couple of days and normally people would go to malls or the library for cooling centers. Um, is the region setting up anything for cooling centers to help people sort of get away from the heat if they don't have AC in their apartments? Uh, Kate, that's a really good question. I think the short answer is I don't think that we have any plans for that. 
I might look to Dr. Wang, but I don't think we have any plans for setting up cooling centers. And you know, our ongoing encouragement to people would be, um, you know, if they're outside, maintain physical distancing and uh, don't congregate in groups of more than five. Um, yeah, the only thing I would I would add is um, there is support available for uh, from sorry uh, community services for people experiencing homelessness uh, during these types of um, hot weather events, and uh, you could you could um, ask them for more information if you'd like. And yes, people can protect themselves from the heat and humidity. Sorry, from the heat and humidity from doing things like drinking plenty of water, taking breaks from the heat by you know, trying to, to stay indoors where they can and uh, take cool showers and try to plan outdoor activities during cooler parts of the day. Great. Um, and also, uh, we saw where Kitchener has canceled um, summer camps for this year. And I know the region, like the Ken Sealing Museum usually runs some. Has the region had more discussions about what's happening with summer camps this year? So yes, the short answer is lots of ongoing discussions about summer camps, both at the region's museums and the region's libraries. As you know, we operate uh, libraries in the four townships. So I would say, Kate, those conversations are ongoing. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out if and how we're able to provide summer day camps in a safe way. We're also expecting uh, to get some guidance from the province over the next little while about um, guidelines for how summer day camps can operate safely and effectively. Because there's, you know, there's dozens, hundreds of organizations across the province that are wrestling with the same issues. And so our hope is uh, that the province, like they've done with many, many other, um, you know, workplaces, will issue a set of guidelines for, um, here's how you can operate a summer day camp um, safely, uh, safely for the staff and safely for the, the, the children and families. So stay tuned. Okay, uh, and for Dr. Wong, um, you know, we saw the scenes from Toronto in Trinity Bellwoods and people um, sort of gathering and the, the reactions online were mixed to that. Some people were like, oh, this is horrible. You shouldn't have done that. And then other people were sort of discounting it and saying, you know, this whole thing has been blown out of proportion and, and we need to be outside and stuff like that. And I'm wondering, for you personally, as um, a doctor in public health, what is it like to have people sort of discount what you're saying as, as being blown out of proportion? Well, you know, I, everyone obviously has the right to their own opinion. Um, what I was heartened to hear um, is that actually in our region, we have by and large been complying with the recommendations. Um, and we didn't have something like what Toronto unfortunately did over the weekend. Um, so, you know, I really, um, uh, obviously there are things that I can recommend, but it's going to rely mostly on the people themselves to be able to make things happen. And, uh, you know, it's really through the efforts of the entire community um, that right now we're starting to see signs of stabilization. And so my comment would be, I really, I, I think Waterloo Region has been doing a very good job. And uh, it's because of the community members that have done their part. And I would just continue to recommend that we continue to fight this together and uh, continue to follow the, the, the recommendations. Great, those are my questions, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Okay, we'll move on to Bill from Cambridge Times. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, uh, good morning. Uh, my question's for Dr. Wong. Um, my first question is, uh, I guess it's a follow-up to Joanna's about uh, Premier Ford's announcement. Um, do you feel public health is prepared? Should there be an influx of tests now that asymptomatic people can also get tested? Yeah, so, so the, the, the testing is really overseen um, by the assessment centers. And um, so, um, as you may have noticed, there, there were some media reports over the weekend um, about the Premier's announcement and uh, 
Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Lee Fairclough, the president of St. Mary's um, answered uh, some of those questions. Uh, she is, um, you know, uh, a, a spokesman for the assessment centers on behalf of the, of the hospitals. Um, so testing is uh, really under the oversight of, um, of the hospitals who run the assessment centers. So I would, you know, for questions about how, how will they respond to the premier's um, Premier's uh, comments, I would refer you to them. Okay. Um, do you feel though, based on history of what we've had, we're well prepared, we're well prepared for testing opening up? Because I know before you had said, yeah. we're hoping we'll go in stages kind of thing. Yeah, no, um, what I know, you know, we're obviously um, one of the partners is, you know, that, uh, that helps uh, support testing uh, through, uh, for example, our our work with the long-term care homes and providing recommendations for those homes uh, about who should be tested um, and you know, um, referring them to testing at the assessment centers. So in you know, working with um, our, our testing partners, uh, we know they have been working really hard to expand uh, testing as much as possible. They have been to date uh, always following the direction and guidance of the province with respect to, you know, who should be prioritized for testing. And I know that they have been working really hard, including through the weekend, uh, to try to make sure that uh, in our region, uh, we have good access to testing. And um, we've had, uh, I've had a couple of people email me and mm -hmm. of course they don't give very much detail, but uh, they say that they've been turned away for, t for testing even since the announcement, is there, I guess, maybe a general comment, is there any reason now that anybody should be turned away for us? Well, if you look at the, the, the again, I, I actually, I'm not the first person that gets those uh, directions from the province in terms of who should be accepted for testing or not. It's really our health, uh, sorry, our, our testing partners, we get those. Uh, but my understanding is, again, that they're working really hard to make sure that whoever they've been directed to open testing to uh, through the direction they get directly from the province, um, they are working to make that available or it is already available. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure um, where those other stories come from, but again, they, they would probably be best suited to, to respond to that question. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Thanks, Bill. We'll move on to Nicole from CTV. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is along the lines of uh, testing. Um, if there is a demand, are you considering opening up more sites? And if so, where? Hi, good morning, Nicole. Uh, so yeah, so um, as, as testing and the, the, the sites and the models are the oversight of the, of the hospitals, uh, I would refer you to them for that question. Okay. Um, with the number of new cases uh, across Ontario uh, trending up over the last few days, are you concerned about the impact that may have on the caseload here in Waterloo Region, given that the province is continuing to reopen businesses or perhaps people coming here from other areas and bringing the virus with them? That's something that I'm watching closely. Um, because yes, I, I, I've seen those numbers uh, as well. and. Um, it will be something that will be important for for everywhere in Ontario to be watching because uh, those would be the signs that you know we're having maybe some ca more cases again. So we're not seeing this right now in our in our region, but we have to be very vigilant and continue to watch. I guess this is along the same lines. Then um, you know, for families now thinking about small day trips or perhaps wanting to go visit family members this summer, would you recommend them get tested before they travel outside of the region? No, the most important thing for people to do is to take those public health measures, including not socializing with people outside of their family circles for now and continuing to limit gatherings to less than five uh, I would just recommend people not socialize outside of their household settings, period. And testing is, 
is not a way to guarantee that people are not in, you know, that are going go to determine who has been infected. So the best defense is actually to prevent the infection in the first place. And so the best thing for families to do would be to follow those public health, um, public health um, recommendations in terms of social distancing and what I mentioned about not socializing with members outside of your household. Um, and uh, you know the, the, the province has expanded testing now uh, to people, uh, you know, they whatever they have expanded testing to. So it seems like there's a, a you know, a broadly people who would like to get tested can be tested. Uh, but testing again is just a point in time assessment um, that um, you know could reveal at that point in time that their test result is positive. Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they're, they're not at risk for being, it doesn't mean they're not at risk for being infected. It's possible only also if they're early in their, in their disease progression, the test doesn't pick up the result, et cetera. So because they're, they're asymptomatic, so you wouldn't know exactly when to test people who are asymptomatic. Anyways, um, I think the, uh, the, the, I think, sorry, I think I'm going a little bit. Uh, I think the best advice that people, that families and people can do is follow the public health measures. Okay, I, I think my next question may be for either Mike Murray or Karen Redmond, since you're the chair of the police board. Um, you know, given that, uh, you know, what happened over the weekend in Toronto, while it may not ha have happened here, you know, people are wondering why just not find more people to get the message out there is there a concern about the legal ramifications of such fines by bylaw enforcement or, um, you know, bylaw officers about potential challenges uh, to the chart of rights in regards to the freedom of assembly? Um, so maybe I'll just make a couple comments and then turn it over to Chair Redmond. Um, you know, I think we've said all along, our goal is compliance. Our goal isn't to issue charges. Um, what we've seen with um, regional bylaw, area municipal bylaw, public health inspectors, and Waterloo Region Police is they do lots of uh, site visits, they do lots of intervention, and for the most part, uh, people are compliant. Sometimes need a bit of a reminder, and then for the most part, they're compliant. I think we've issued, somebody probably will have the data, you know, we've issued uh, 12 charges, and um, We've not heard any concerns expressed by people who've been charged about violation of their charter rights. And, and Nicole, I guess I would just add to that. Uh, nobody took it lightly when the province declared a state of emergency and none of the area municipal mayors or I took it lightly when we declared states of emergency. And that gives us special authority and extraordinary powers because these are unusual times. So I think that's the backdrop upon which um, these fines are now being levied. So not a huge concern, but just to back up what Mr. Murray said, we will never um, have enough bylaw officers, uh, public health inspectors or police to fine everyone. So education and compliance, which has been very good within the region, obviously wasn't adhered to in Toronto. And that was um, very heart wrenching when you're on the front lines as uh, some of us are, and we look at the kind of input and the dedication of all of our health sector of public health, of paramedics, of police, and the frontline healthcare workers and recognize that all of that has been put in jeopardy by people who are putting the fatigue of the, um, being isolated during a pandemic against the um, community and the greater good. So very disappointing to see in Toronto, not a trend we've seen here, one that we hope we won't because we'll still have cooperation of the community. Um, I think this is a question for Mike Murray. Um, as the city of Waterloo considers changes to roads and parks for more access for physical distancing and activity, is the region looking to implement similar changes in um, other areas? Um, and if so, where? Yeah. So. Um... Regional staff and area municipal staff are working together on, you know, what, if anything, could or should be done in terms of um, 
you know, giving people more access to more space to create adequate physical distancing. Uh, one of the specific things that um, is being looked at again by regional and air municipal staff is uh, can we do anything to allow for expanded outdoor patios at restaurants and bars? And, you know, in some cases that may mean expanding into parking spaces in parking lots, expanding into um, curbside lanes. Uh, so that's one of the specific issues that's being looked at. As you can imagine, you know, that's not a simple matter. Um, you know, that has a lot of implications. And so regional staff and area municipal staff together uh, are trying to work their way through that, as well as looking at, you know, other potential, uh, you know, call it active transportation um, enhancements. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We'll move on to Kevin from Global. Hi, uh, given uh, that the number of cases across the province has gone back up over 400 and we seem to have kind of uh, leveled off to about seven a day, should the province be considering uh, different sets of rules for different communities? I think that's, that's very hard to, uh, to determine at this point because these things are very, um, these things can be quite pre 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 precarious. Um, we don't, you know, always every day align with what we see provincially, but um, that doesn't mean that based on recent trends, uh, we could, we, 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 I would feel comfortable to say we could reopen faster than the province, for example. Uh, I think this is a very precarious situation and we could see uh, later this week or next week, for example, some of the initial effects of the reopening that have happened to date. Um, and we'll continue to see in the coming weeks the effects of the increased reopening that has been happening, um, you know, in the last few weeks. Um, and we're continuing to reopen more. So we have to really be careful. And really a lot of it is in our hands as a community. Um, you know, when things like what happened in Toronto over the weekend happen, that really puts our community at risk. Um, when, but, but, but when we see what we saw in the region this past weekend, where people by and large were physically distancing, where a lot of people were wearing masks, where people were being courteous with others and making sure that, you know, they had the ability to physical distance, um, that's going to really help our community and that's going to be, um, you know, uh, the, the, the main driver actually of what happens to our rates here. So we have to be careful um, and we'll have to watch this for now. And if, if I could just add, um, you know, we've also heard provincial officials say over the last number of weeks, uh, they've expressed their concern about differentially opening up different parts of the province at different times. And one of the points that they've made, which I think is a valid point is, uh, you know, if, if they take different measures in different areas, you may well see um, migration or an influx of people, you know, if, if they chose an area of the province said, okay, we're going to open up uh, bars and restaurants in a specific area. Um, you may well see people traveling, people are mobile, and you may well see people traveling uh, to take advantage of uh, services and amenities opening up in different areas, um, you know, which would potentially uh, exacerbate um, the community transmission of, uh, of COVID-19. So I think that's another concern is, uh, you know, these, our areas don't exist in isolation. Um, it's all, everything is connected. I guess that's true, but uh, North Bay is certainly not in a similar situation to Toronto. It's, it's not like a one size fits all, seems to make sense for everybody in the province, right? Uh, that's true, Kevin. I mean, um, there are some, um, like, if we take a look at the broader uh, uh, differences from the north, for example, compared to the south of Ontario, yes. And, you know, we're, we're like a large municipality, and so we're going to have trends that are more similar to the larger municipalities in Ontario. So you're correct about that, yes. So the person that passed away a couple of weeks ago, uh, were they tested post post Posthumously? Uh, I 
don't have the specifics of that on me right now, but I know that has been done for a number of cases associated with the Forest Heights outbreak. Uh, and you know, they were they uh, were in hospital at the time of their death, and um, and you know it was uh, when when some of the people are in the hospital, sometimes it's sometimes we it takes a bit of a while to get that information in, and we we um, they passed away in mid May, and uh, we didn't have it on our list yet, so it was a bit of a delay, unfortunately, but we have it now on our list. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'll go to Ben at 570. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you very much. This is uh, just a quick question for Mike Murray. Mike, do we have any preliminary numbers on compliance for the weekend? Did we see any sort of spike in charges or was it pretty quiet or should we just expect those numbers later this week? Yep, so I would say short answer is expect the numbers on Wednesday. Uh, but uh, I did get a quick email from, um, from some of our staff who uh, said, you know, it was a relatively calm weekend. Uh, and they were particularly reflecting on, you know, some of the, the stories coming out of Toronto and said, you know, we saw nothing like that here. So, um, well, I haven't seen um, the, the details of the monitoring compliance and enforcement activity. We'll report on that on Wednesday, but by all accounts, um, no big spike in issues. All right, thank you. This, uh, second question, just quickly for Dr. Wong here. Uh, I know we talked about asymptomatic testing a few times last week, and you said it was it's just a point in time, not quite as effective. Did it come as a surprise to you that Doug Ford invited everyone to just walk in, no appointment or symptoms necessary? Uh, yeah, he provided that direction uh, to the public, and then I understand um, direction was provided to the assessment centers. Um, so... Yeah, uh, sometimes this, this information is uh, coming directly from the province, sometimes directly from the news. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I know is uh, that the, uh, the assessment center <laughs> leads are, have been working very hard and continue to do so uh, to um, you know, follow the direction of the province. Okay, thank you. No further questions for now. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so that uh, wraps up the first round. I'll look for a show of hands. Um, anyone has further questions? Okay, Damon, go ahead. Okay, so mine's for Mike Murray. Um, like cases like uh, Trinity Bellwood Parks, are we ex like if we do see kind of these protest people getting like stir crazy and coming out in large gatherings, are we ready to deal with this? Uh, so, Damon, I would say two things. One is, you know, we don't really like to deal with hypothetical uh, questions, but the other short answer is, yes, we're ready. Uh, you know, and I've, I've talked a number of times about uh, the number of people and different organizations that we have working on enforcement. Um, so you could probably list them off right now. Regional bylaw, local bylaw, uh, water region police, and public health inspectors. Between all of those organizations, We've got a lot of resources. And Damon, I would just add, um, our, you know, like a lot of residents here in Waterloo Region have been doing, they are going out. They are able to, you know, come up, go out of the house and do physical activity outdoors, but they were practicing physical distancing. They were, you know, sticking with their household members. They were, um, you know, following the recommendations. So it's, it's possible to, to, to go out and uh, you know to enjoy the outdoors while following the recommendations. So, you know, I would just recommend that, that people do that as a way to, uh, you know, um, do what they need to do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Damon. So, Joanna, you had a question as well, and I see Nicole's hand. So we'll go to Joanna next. Thank you. Uh, another question from a colleague for Dr. Wong. Mm -hmm. So there's been some delays and confusion and mismatches with data. Um, are you concerned that numbers are sometimes different, such as uh, resolved cases and unresolved cases? I know Jeff out had asked about this previously. Mm -hmm. And then just a second question related to that. Does that hamper your understanding of how 
to end the pandemic if we don't have a clear picture of what's actually going on? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of data requirements that we have to fulfill, you know, a lot of reporting that we have to do up to the province, for example, uh, and those, you know, requests can come in very, you know, with very short time, timelines to complete. And the other thing we've also uh, worked hard on here in our region is to provide good quality data to our community uh, through the dashboard. And we've tried to make enhancements uh, to, the, to the dashboard uh, over time. And we do things like quality control checks. Uh, so uh, I, I think one of the things that um, we've done and I think we'll continue to do is prioritize uh, where we think it's most important to have the most up-to-date data. So for example, um, you know, the data uh, were one of the few health units I understand who actually maintains a, a very comprehensive list of, um, of outbreaks and numbers for, for each outbreak. Uh, and uh, we might have been the first time, I'm not sure, but um, you know, that's an area where we have put a lot of effort uh, into making sure that we have timely daily updates about the outbreak status in long-term care homes and retirement homes. And uh, because it was a very, very important issue, an issue that severely impacted our region as well as elsewhere in Ontario and in Canada. So we wanted to focus on that. In regards to the number of resolved cases, yes, the definition has changed over time. Um, and uh, I think, um, you may recall I had mentioned that we tended to be quite strict with when we considered cases resolved. Um, you know, sometimes it was hard for us to reach a case and confirm they were resolved, et cetera. So we didn't necessarily mark them as resolved. And uh, when we were also dealing with significant outbreaks, um, classifying cases as resolved in the database wasn't as high a priority as actually managing the cases, managing the outbreak. So some of that does and did lead to some data, uh, data lags and definitions change. So exa example, the definitions for what's considered resolved change. We just very recently found out now the province is in their database using a very time-based approach. For example, for most people, it's been 14 days since they've started their symptoms, they're resolved, right? And, and, and that's it, it's a data, it's a data uh, process that, 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 that's automated, whereas we were contacting people and confirming their results. So there can be some delay in some of the data elements. And, uh, but what we've been trying to do is at least provide what we thought were the most important pieces of data in as timely way and as updated way as possible. For the resolved cases, um, you know, with the new provincial definition, we are in the process, and we started this over the weekend, uh, in the process of reconciling our, our individual cases with the new guidance from the province. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, so I think there will be some changes to our resolved data. Um, again, it, you know, if it didn't directly impact the management of the cases or the management of the outbreak, uh, we wouldn't have necessarily prioritized that data. Um, so I would say that uh, by and large, I think we, uh, we have done a good job with data. Um, there are things that, um, you know, uh, we approved upon and, and those are, are, are things that we're gonna continue to look to do. Um, so um, I don't think that because of those things, it's really, hampered our ability to uh, uh, you know, manage COVID or help, help, help all of us as a community manage COVID. Um, but of course, you know, any improvements we've made, we'll, um, we're, we're glad we've, we've made them and we'll continue to, uh, to look for ways that we can improve. All right, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Okay, go ahead, Nicole. Um, you talked about some recent changes um, in terms of guidance from the province. Um, mm -hmm. Was guidance in regards to testing a part of that? Because, um, you know, this week is the first time where we've heard you say, you know, refer to the testing centers or ask them for some of their um, directives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've mentioned that 
you know, the directive to test everybody now who are, even if they're asymptomatic, that came as news. And I, was that just, is there now a change in communication lines going directly to the testing centers from the province or is it coming down from public health still? So, cause I'm a bit confused um, in terms of where they get yeah. their directions from. Sure. sure, it's always, it's always actually been the hospitals that have had oversight over the assessment uh, centers where testing is, um, where testing mostly is done. Um, public health, you know, has um, been a, a partner in supporting um, the, the system overall in terms of um, um, recommendations where we could, uh, for example, you know, when we would get information about in the early days about um, countries, right, uh, that, uh, uh, that 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 people who, who were coming from. Uh, would need to self-isolate after coming back from those countries. And we would be getting the, that information and um, the countries could change daily. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it was difficult, for example, our testing partners to keep up with the influx of daily travel information or stuff like that. And, but that's something we could get and we could work on collating. So we help support our partners in that way. Um, you know, and when there was um, the testing done in the long-term care homes, the uh, very, um, significant amount of uh, whole home testing that was done. Uh, you know, public health has a relationship uh, with those homes that are an outbreak. And we have contacts with those homes because we deal with them on, on a seasonal basis when we manage outbreaks of the flu and other respiratory viruses with them. So we were able to facilitate, uh, for example, the testing uh, done by the assessment centers, uh, if they were done by the assessment centers or their mobile teams with the homes because we had that contact and we could do some things to facilitate that testing being done uh, quickly. So those are ways that we have continued to uh, provide support, uh, you know, to the system overall in terms of testing. Um, I have been on these media briefings uh, for, you know, from the sort of from the beginning. And so uh, what, what the information that I knew from the testing partners, I would relay. Um, but um, you know, it, it, it was always the assessment centers uh, that had that oversight, and public health continues to be a partner that supports where we can. Um, a lot of the you know information related to the expansion of testing is coming directly from the province uh, to the assessment centers, and uh, it's actually you know, um, not something that we necessarily get at the same time. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a, I think, a reinforcement of what was uh, sort of always the, the, um, the, 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 the flow of direction. And uh, when, it's, uh, when it's expanded to areas that public health traditionally is not as familiar with or cannot provide as much support with, um, then I think it makes sense for those assessment centers to speak to 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 to, um, to those topics like um, you know hours of operation or types of um, referrals to like SAPT or things like that. Thanks. Okay, so that looks like. Uh, is there any other hands? None out there. Okay, so we can wrap things up. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, today and we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Take care.